And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Who doesn't recognize those lines that are from George Frederick Handel's Messiah that he wrote, I believe it was in the 1700s, 1742, I think I had a note in my Bible here, reminded me that in uh, 24 days he wrote that enormous uh, piece that you can go and listen to now, and it's very, very, very moving. In the very early book, in the very early chapters, I should say, in the book of Revelation, there was a great scroll be, that is described as being unrolled. And this great being that we see in the early chapters of the book of Revelation breaks these seals, as it were, of this scroll. And as he breaks these first five seals, of which there are seven, we see these events begin to unfold, described by Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is the revelator. He was the one that revealed what these events meant, what these actual seals meant. When he answered his disciples, you remember his disciples asked him, what, are the, what is the end of the age? When will it be the end of the age and what will be the sign of your coming? He said to them that there were going to be wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. And, of course, religious persecution. And he described all these upheavals uh, unlike any time ever before in history. At the very culmination of these events that he described, Jesus, that is, in Matthew, the 24th chapter, which they are biblical scholars and even Jesus himself called the Great Tribulation. And, and by the way, the Great Tribulation primarily falls upon the nation of Israel. You remember in Jacob, uh, Jeremiah the 30th chapter, it says it's a time of Jacob's trouble. And I won't go into that other than to, if you want to further uh, look further into that subject, you could order our book, Europe and American Prophecy, and it goes into that in great detail about the identity of the nation of Israel today. Who is modern day Israel? The sixth seal... After those five seals were mentioned, the sixth seal that would be open, God actually interrupts human affairs with a display of heavenly signs. It's described there in Matthew, the 24th chapter, and also over in Joel, the second chapter. In verse 31, it says, The sun shall be darkened and the moon will be turned into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So we have known for many years the order of events that's described both in the New Testament and Old that there was going to be a time of great tribulation that was going to fall upon mankind, that there would be these great heavenly signs depicted in this sixth seal that is opened as he unrolls this scroll that is called the heavenly signs. And then the final event, the third of which is the day of the Lord the second coming of Jesus Christ in the establishment of the kingdom of God. We've always asked, where is there room for the rapture in that order of events? Because most people, most modern Christianity believes that the church is going to be raptured away somehow. When you read these order of events, you understand that the great tribulation comes first, then these heavenly signs, and then the day of the Lord. And when are God's people to be rescued? Well, the Bible tells us that, that, the, that His saints are going to be delivered out of tribulation, doesn't it, in, on one occasion. <clears throat> and as I said, uh, and of course, and we finally come to the seventh seal, which is what we just read here that, that is opened. And this seventh seal, if we read that again, it says the seventh angel sounded. Well, this book of Revelation is broken up into a group of several groups of seven, first of which, as I said, is, are those seven seals. As he begins to unroll the scroll, he breaks these seals, and there are seven. The seventh seal is broken up into seven trumpet plagues, 
And the last of those three trump, uh, seven trumpet plagues are called three woes. The last of the third woe is further broken up into seven last plagues. And that's where we find ourselves in verse 15 of Revelation 11 chapter. And I'm sorry I didn't give you that verse at the beginning here. I'm in Revelation 11 chapter down at verse 15. I'll read that again. And the seventh angel sounded and there was a great voice, voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ and He shall reign forever and ever. So what is the inference here? What, is, what are we reading here? What is, we're reading here actually the culmination of all of those seals that are open the seventh of those trumpet plagues, at the very end of those seven trumpet plagues, this final blast of this trumpet sounds, and we see here in this scripture the second coming of Jesus Christ in the establishment of the reign of Jesus Christ here on this earth. And it is actually a fulfillment of what we read in Daniel. You remember Daniel saw that great, he described to Nebuchadnezzar that great image. And at the end of that, he said that great image that had the head of gold and the, and the breastplate of silver and the legs of, th the thighs of brass and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay and the toes are of iron and clay. And he saw this rock that was cut out without hands smashed the image on its toes and the whole image came crashing down and it says it became as like powder and like the chaff on a summer threshing floor when a wind, strong wind comes blowing by, it blew it all away and it just completely disappeared. But then that rock, that little stone began to grow and encompassed the whole earth and became a great mountain and it reigned over the whole earth. A description here of Jesus Christ actually smashing all the world ruling empires, the remnants of all these world ruling empires and having them completely be disintegrated and then His government rising out of the midst and encompassing the whole earth and of course reigning here on the earth. In Zechariah the 14th chapter it says His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. We, and we've read that scripture on many occasions, usually at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. That's, we describe that. Look what it says in verse 16. It says, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell on their faces and worshiped God. You know, you, when you think about heaven, you don't often think about these twenty-four elders and what they look like and what their role is as maybe advisors there of, of what is going on in the universe. And yet they see the fulfillment of this scripture and they fall down on their faces as if, as if to recognize the actual fulfillment of all these prophecies that have been of old. That God is eventually going to establish His kingdom right here on this earth. And they fall down and worship Him, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because you have taken thee thy great power and has reigned. So the, as I said, the actual fulfillment of all those ancient prophecies about the one who would come to reign over the earth. Verse 18, And the nations were angry. I pause there to say, why are the, the nations angry? Why do nations become angry? I wrote that in my notes in capital letters, angry. Why are nations angry? You know, David in the second Psalm wrote, why do the heathen rage? Well, David recognized when he wrote that Psalm that the heathen nations were always attacking God's anointed king, who he was. He had been anointed by God, and yet these heathen nations were constantly attacking him. And he just said, why are they in such a rage all the time? When their attacks, he knew, were going to be doomed to failure. They were always going to be doomed to failure because they found themselves fighting against God. Prophetically speaking, I believe that the psalm symbolizes 
not only the attacks on David, but it, the future attacks on God's people, but especially upon the son of David, Jesus Christ, and the attacks that are against him. And we, he goes on to say, and your wrath is come. God's wrath is going to ultimately be poured out upon the sin-sick world. And the time of the dead that they should be judged. And of course that's referring to the Revelation the 20th chapter when the great white throne judgment happens. And those that are dead that are going to be judged. It says, and that you should give a reward unto your servants the prophets and to the saints. So there is a, a reward that comes to people who live a godly life and that are faithful to Jesus Christ their whole life, even though this society doesn't want you to live that way. The difficulty, the rocky road that we have to walk being Christians. And them that fear your name, both small and great, and should destroy them that destroy the earth. I wrote in my margin here, John 3, verse 16. People like to quote that scripture where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But they don't finish that scripture in, in most cases where it says that those that believe on him should not perish. That scripture goes on to say that those that don't believe in him, it, the implication is, is that they're going to perish. But those that do believe him, in him would have everlasting life. We know that in the book of Malachi it says, it says of the Lord that he is going to tread down the wicked and they're going to be ashes under the feet of the righteous. God is going to judge this world and he is going to put down wickedness and evil. And the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was, a, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his covenant and there was a lightning and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Of course describing this event as it's unfolding almost as if it were live. I, when I read that scripture, I wonder where that ark is today. It makes me ponder when I read history and I read what happened in Babylon when they took the, all the accoutrements of the temple, the, the, the vessels of the temple, and I stood there and looked at that arch of Titus and know that the Romans, when they sacked Jerusalem, carried out that great big candelabra and, the, and the, many of the uh, vessels of the temple. Where did they go? Was the, but you know what is not depicted in that drawing? And that's etched in stone on that arch of Titus there in Rome? Is the ark. The ark. Was it hidden by someone? Was it carried somewhere? Was it hidden somewhere by some priest there in Jerusalem? Or was it carried out of Jerusalem to some distant land? It makes you wonder. I get chill bumps thinking about the idea that that ark still exists somewhere today. And it is absolute proof of this very word that we have laying on our laps here. Of a story that goes back to our beginning. In chapter, the, uh, in chapter 12... I'd like to go, go on further a little bit here and uh, read to you. We go here, actually, we read in chapter 11 the very culmination of God's plan and the very inception. Uh, actually, we go from the culmination, I should say, of history to the very inception of the idea in God's mind and this is a huge flashback here in chapter 12. We go to the, like I said, the inception in the mind of God of His great plan the, of God to create the earth, to put man upon Him, and to give Him the opportunity at salvation. And of course, to become the sons of God. And we read that here in chapter 12 and verse 1. There appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun. And that, of course, describes God's absolute brilliance, His glory. We know that the sun is, is a symbol of great light. As, as from our perspective here on earth, that, that that sun is brilliant. When it comes up in the morning, we see it broadcast across the earth. It brings light to us, and we know that it warms the earth. 
The symbolism is there. We read last week in John, the first chapter, that Jesus Christ was the, he is the Word. He was in the beginning with God, and He was God, and in Him is life, and He is the light of the world. We know we're instructed too. Jesus told us that we're to be a light or a lamp upon a hill. As Christians, we're to set this great example. We're to bring light into the lives of people. As Jesus Christ's light shine or God's light shines in us, it is to be reflected into other people's lives. But in the very beginning of the book of Revelation here, it describes the seven churches being the seven golden candlesticks as if they were spreading light throughout the whole world. <clears throat> it says, There was a wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. We know that the moon is, does not put off light of itself, is it? So the moon here, and some of the commentaries will say that the moon is actually a depiction of a false light. It's actually under her feet, as if put down. The real light is the brilliance of God's throne and His gospel message. But the worldly light is one like the moon, that it doesn't have real light within itself. It only claims to have the true light. And so it is in this depiction here being put, down, put under her feet. And upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And of course, this is indicative. <coughs> Many of the scholars will describe this being indicative of the 12 tribes of Israel that would eventually bring forth the man-child, the salvation of all mankind. And, and of course, the 12 disciples as well in the New Testament that began the New Testament church that had the gospel message that was going to go out. And what was that gospel message about? It was about the coming kingdom of God that would ultimately be established here on this earth that would encompass the whole earth. And of course, that is what we're describing here in these chapters. And she being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. There is, I'd like to take a little time out here. And J Jesus gave this description. You, you remember he said on one occasion, a little while and you shall not see me. And, and a little while you will see me again. And of course, his disciples said, what in the world is he talking about? A little while we'll not see him. In a little while we'll see him. He said, well, you know, when a woman is in labor and she's having all these enormous labor pains, anyone who's had a child, you ladies will understand, us men, we just have to sit out in the waiting room and smoke a cigar and hope that everything goes well. But you ladies have gone through the birthing pains and that first little cramp and little uh, pain that comes along and you know that it's time. And of course, us guys, we go crazy and we, we go hysterical. We think we've, we've got only 30 seconds for this to happen. A lot of times it takes hours before the baby actually comes. Jesus described that and he said, while the woman is in labor, she has all these horrible pains, but as soon as the child is born, she forgets all about those labor pains because now her focus is on a man child that has been or a child that has been brought into the world. Later on, Paul uses that same description. He says the whole earth groans and we also as Christians groan within ourselves to be delivered for that moment, that moment in time for this event that we're describing here to happen. The second coming of Jesus Christ, we wait for it. It's like we're in labor pains right now. Isaiah in verse Isaiah 66 says, Shall the earth bring forth in one day? It's as if we're in these huge labor pains, and the great tribulation is a, is a description of these labor pains that are coming one right after another until this event that happens when the earth brings forth the children of God. And I think it is put beautifully it being described that way. And of course, not along with that description of the very birth of the sons of God, the saints of God, being born into the family of God, we come immediately to the contrast in verse 3. 
the opposition of God's magnificent plan. It says, And there appeared another wonder or sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. I sat down and wrote all of the terms that are exist here in the next few verses here, and nowhere in the Bible will you find more uh, descriptive words of Satan the devil than you will in these next few verses anywhere in the Bible. They're all right here. It says... He's called a red, a red dragon. We know that red is depicted or descriptive of his murderous character. He is called the serpent, which means he is subtle. He was there in the garden with Adam and Eve, and he used subtlety to talk her into taking of that fruit of that tree that, that was forbidden. He's called the devil, which that word actually means slanderer. He's called Satan. That word means the adversary. He's called the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, and he's also a war-mongering evil demon. And we'll look at some of those scriptures here in a moment or refer to them at least. It says, There was a wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. I wrote here, we could take time to turn over to Revelation, the 17th chapter, and other references here. But we know that Satan here is at the very helm of a great socio-economic, geopolitical, military superpower. And if anybody has been around the church very long and understood and even read these scriptures in the, in the book of Revelation, it talks about these two powers, the great beast power and this false prophet that are in collusion one with another. And Satan is at the very helm of power over this great beast power. They are in collusion with a false religious system, as I said, which is described in Revelation, the 17th chapter, who is a woman who reigns over the kings of the earth. And, of course, it describes that woman as being that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. In Revelation, the 18th chapter, it also tells us to come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. These exact plagues, these same plagues, these trumpet plagues that are being poured out by God upon the earth. But here in, in a little more detail, it describes these seven heads. And as I said over in the book of Revelation, it says that those seven heads are seven mountains upon which the lady sits. And you can go look that up and determine what city it is that sets or is called a city of seven hills. And we know that it is Rome. It is Rome. And, it, and the ten horns that he described here are ten kings. And later in the book of Revelation it says, These are ten kings which have no power as yet, but received power as king one hour with the beast. A very short period of time they're going to give and that same passage of Scripture says that they have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast, and they will make war with the Lamb. <coughs> Excuse me. When I think about that and read those Scriptures there, I think about Adolf Hitler as he began to ally himself with those Axis powers, every one of which didn't realize that he was going to turn on them. Once he gathered the power and support of Russia and Italy and the Axis powers, and he even made promises to even Great Britain and France, all the time he was shredding those agreements behind closed doors, knowing that his, his intent was to ultimately rule the world himself. And I see that depicted in this great beast power. He's going to convince these ten kings to pool their resources, to pool their strength and their monetary and military might. All the while, he's going to turn his back on every single one of them because he wants absolute power over them all. And we'll see that again. We'll see that portrayed in, his, in, in, in the future, I believe. And of course, this is describing Satan the devil. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them down to the earth. I wrote a couple of uh, scriptures here. Isaiah, the fourth, 14th chapter, it says, How art thou fallen, O Lucifer, which was called Lightbringer. His actual name meant Lightbringer. Son of the morning, I will ascend. And he said in that scripture, I will ascend unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. 
Later in Ezekiel, the 28th chapter, it says, He was called the anointed cherub that covereth. Was Lucifer there beside the very throne of God? That scripture seems to indicate that. It says he was upon the holy mountain of God and that he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. My mind tries to think what that must have been like. To be there with God Almighty. He was right there in the very throne room of God. But it says he was perfect until iniquity was found in him. And of course we know the result of that. I've often pondered what was it that made Satan rebel? What one event made Satan so absolutely furious and so jealous to cause him to give up such a royal place? And it can only be that God's idea here that he may have portrayed somehow that he was going to bring into his family sons and daughters through his own son. And that so infuriated Satan because he wanted that power and he wanted that position. And he did everything he could. He stormed out of that throne room trying from then till now to wreck God's plan of doing that. It says he drew a third part of the stars of heaven. We know that we read those scriptures and I'd like to turn... I hope I wrote that scripture down. I don't think I did. I may have to refer to it <clears throat> where it tells us that in the book of Daniel. When, you remember when Daniel prayed and the angel appeared to him and said, I heard your prayer. God heard your prayer and he sent me to answer your prayer. But I was withheld because the prince of Persia withheld me. It's as if he was fighting against a demonic spirit. And it said that he had to be rescued so that he could be freed up to come and answer Daniel's prayer. We know that in the book of Romans, uh, Paul wrote and told us that we don't fight against uh, physical beings oftentimes, but we fight against evil spirits and evil de demonic spirits in high places. And sometimes our struggle isn't with flesh and blood but with a demonic spirit that is trying to disrupt God's perfect plan. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them down to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And, and all of the scholars agree that that is probably a reference to the time when Herod sent that horrible edict out to slaughter the children two years old and younger. Can you imagine living there in that day and having these awful Roman soldiers kick doors in and hurl babies against the wall and spears and, and, and absolutely kill all of these precious little children because he was trying to kill Jesus Christ because they weren't sure how old he was, that he might have been as much as two years old at that point. And, he, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron We've jokingly said and quoted uh, Revelation, the 19th chapter. We'll just flip over there real quick and read this scripture. Revelation, the 19th chapter, verse 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With, that, with, with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. We've often, as I said, we've often jokingly said Jesus is not coming back as a humble carpenter anymore. This time he's not going to come back as a humble carpenter. He's going to come back to this earth and he is very angry with what is going on on this earth. And I mean, when you talk about ruling a nation with a rod of iron, that means you're going to use that rod of iron against people that are so absolutely rebellious and disobedient that are horrible human beings that cause agony and pain for human beings. I would love myself some of these horrible countries where these evil dictators live, to go in there and just absolutely tell them, you, 
you're going to be paralyzed from the eyebrows down for the next six months. And really make it happen. Make it stick where they can't absolutely talk. But they see all of what happens around them. And go into the cabinet room and say, you're all fired. And get rid of every single one of them. And ensconce people that are absolute Christian character. That want the good for people. And want righteousness to reign in a nation. And begin to have them keep God's laws and to worship on the Sabbath day instead of working seven, you know, as they say, 24-7 or 365 days a year and never have a break. Absolutely start keeping God's laws about the holy days and teaching them about God's great plan. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be nice to see a country do that? He says, uh, let's go on. It says, and the woman fled... Uh, let me finish up verse 5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of her with a rod of her iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Acts the first chapter, the disciples saw that. They saw him descend up completely out of their sight. Later on in the book of Acts, it says Stephen saw when he was being stoned to death. He said, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And they absolutely went into a blind rage. And finished the job of stoning him to death when he saw that great vision. And the woman fled into the wilderness, which she hath a place prepared of God, that she should feed that he should that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And of course, this is referring here to the time of the Great Tribulation, the three and one half year period. Daniel in Daniel the twelfth chapter. He says, how long will these things prevail? And it says in Daniel that it would be a time, times, and half. In other words, two and one and a half. So three and one half years that he was going to accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people. In Revelation 11 chapter, verse 2, it calls it 42 months when the holy city would be trodden under the foot of the those Gentile powers. And in the very next verse, he says that it would be 1,203 score days that exactly at that same time, the two witnesses would be giving their prophecy and their testimony to the world and telling them, don't do this. Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth and he's going to execute judgment upon you. And they will not listen. It's apparent from what we read in the, in the scriptures that they're not going to listen and those two witnesses are going to actually be killed at the very end of that. He says down in verse uh, Revelation, the, the uh, 12th chapter down in verse 7, it says, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. I like to think of Michael and Gabriel who was there that talked to Daniel, those two powerful angels along with two-thirds of the angels that are on God's side, absolutely kicking Satan and his demonic spirits out of the presence of God. Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He saw and witnessed that event. It says, And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, Ephesians 2 and verse 2, he's called the prince of the power of the air. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he's called the God of this world. A lot of people don't realize that Satan, the devil, has control over the vast majority of this earth, all of its people, and most of its religions. He's called that old serpent, he's called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. And that is the crowning achievement of his power, that he deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. As I said, the Apostle Paul said that we don't often fight against flesh and blood. It's not always the other person's fault. But we're fighting sometimes against demonic influences that cause people to do certain things and give them these horrible feelings. I don't understand, that's how, I I, I cannot understand how a man can kill his whole family of six or seven. And I read reports of that every once in news reports of that every once in a while. Well, they go in and 
go into a blind. I watched a man last night on the news that was in prison. He was in prison, I believe it was back in the 1980s or, or late 70s, who went into a blind rage and killed his wife and six of his children. And he says he don't even remember doing it. He doesn't, that's the only way I can understand how somebody could do or perpetrate such a, a heinous act as that, is if they're under the influence of a demonic spirit. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which, is, which accuses them or accused them before our God day and night. Go back and read Job where it tells us that Satan was walking up and down in the earth and he's there before presenting himself before God. But I do want to quote a scripture here, Rebel, uh, Romans the 8th chapter. I'm going to turn over there real quickly. We'll come right back to the book of Revelation. Revel, uh, Romans the 8th chapter, it says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now Satan's there trying to accuse against you. Accuse you of everything that you ever said, did, and thought. But here Paul is saying, Who's going to lay anything to God's elect? It is God that justifies. And how did he do that? By the blood of his own Son. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So while the accuser is there, blaming, accusing, trying to judge, Jesus Christ is there making intercession and saying, I was a human being once. I walked in their shoes. I understand the great troubles and trials they go through. I see the looks. I've seen the looks and the attitudes of people that hate God. So God, please forgive them. They're weak. They're human. They're fleshly. But they're trying to live a Christian life. He says... Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? Jesus went through every one of those. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I, this is Paul speaking, am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a beautiful scripture that is. What a great deal of hope that is. Returning now back to the book of Revelation in chapter 12. He says down in verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony... I wrote in my margin here the Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you ever care, and I don't advise you to do it. But go back and read some of the people who were standing there as they were piling the wood on to burn them at the stake. And the testimony that is recorded that they gave at that moment, when they knew they were going to die a horrible death, said, how can I recant on the name of Jesus Christ who is rescued me from this life. And they were burned to death and tortured in, in all hideous ways that you can imagine. Their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and ye that dwell in them. In Psalm, the 96th chapter, David also wrote, He comes to judge the world in righteousness. But he says at the end of that verse there, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knows his time is short. There is a scripture in the book of Revelation where an angel cries out and said, Time is no more. Time is running out. Time is running out for the evil people of this world, but also... It gives me a little bit of a warning here because I remember the story Jesus told of the, t of the ten virgins. Time is also running out for those who are fence sitters. Those who have maybe waited and decided, I think I'll repent at the very last moment. Time is running out for them as well. 
And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman, the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And of course here describing God's divine protection in that same three and one half year period of time where God is going to protect His saints just like He did those ancient Israelites when He brought them out of the land of Egypt and He carried them in the wilderness. He fed them, He clothed them, He gave them water to drink and food to eat and they were protected from their enemies and they had no money, no military might, no food sources of their own and He brought them out and protected them. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water. And of course, this is a, a symbol of overwhelming persecu persecution of God's people. As a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Some sort of a edict is going to go out at this time to destroy all of God's people. But it says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And I believe that is divine intervention for the people of God at that time. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, angry with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. As I said, where is the rapture in all of this? These are the people of God who are standing here on this earth at the very last moment the last second that Satan has, he's going out to make war with the remnant of her seed. And what are they doing? Well, they're those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I tell you, this is a fascinating book right here. These few chapters here not only give us a flashback, to the very inception of God's plan to bring many sons to glory, as he says. But it walks through history. It describes the hardships the people of God have had to face in order to stay faithful to Him. It describes the contrast and contrast the war between Satan and the people of God, the church of God. It also looks to the future at the culmination of history as we know it. And it tells us of a time when God will ultimately judge the earth. As I said, time is running out for those who are against God's plan. Time is running out for those who hate God's people. Time is also running short for the opportunity to repent and to surrender your will or His will and receive the gift of salvation. And time is also running out for Satan the devil, who is our greatest enemy. But time is also drawing near, brethren, when our struggle with evil will be over, when we will be ultimately re reunited or united with Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Let This has been a message... This has been, I should say, our message for many decades. And that is what we should glean from these beautiful scriptures.